In the office of Matins this morning, we read from the first book of Kings, also known as the first book of Samuel, that the Israelites are at war with the Philistines, and the Philistines have defeated the Israelites who have lost 4,000 men on the battlefield. And so they decide to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord onto the battlefield, that he may come among us and save us from the hand of our enemies. And so two scandalous priests, the sons of Eli, Ophri, Ophni, and Phinehas, they accompany the Ark. And the Israelites cheer as the Ark enters their camp. And the Philistines are struck with fear and they say, the gods have come into their camp, woe to us. But even so, the Philistines take courage and they fight. So the Philistines fought and Israel was overthrown. Every man fled, seeking his own safety. There was an exceeding slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. The ark of God was captured by the enemy. And the two sons of Eli, Ophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there we have the lesson from this morning's Office of Matins. Now that office is specifically for today. Today being the, the, historically the Sunday in the octave of Corpus Christi, because Corpus Christi is too big for just one day. And since Corpus Christi commemorates Holy Thursday, the Universal Church always celebrates Corpus Christi on a Thursday. And then the Sunday complements it. Now in the United States, I think for a very, very long time, maybe going back 100 years or more, Corpus Christi has always been moved to Sunday because we're not a Catholic country. People don't get a Thursday off work and we can't have processions in the streets on a Thursday in a, in a country that is not friendly to Catholicism, historically. So in the United States, we've moved it to Sunday and we have our processions on Sunday. However, there's still a separate gospel for today that we did not read, but it's worth us reading for the purpose of a greater understanding. So now let's take a look at what we would have read today if we were in another country. And by the way, uh, our, some, we have a parishioner family of the Tobushes, which are in uh, Spain. And Stephen Tobush sent me some photos. They were in Seville or Sevilla for the Feast of Corpus Christi. And he said the procession was four hours long four hour long procession for Corpus Christi through the whole town. The whole town with floats and marching bands. And doesn't that sound wonderful? But we'll be just fine with our little procession here. Let's take a look at the gospel, according to St. Luke, that is for this Sunday in the octave of Corpus Christi. At that time, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees this parable. A certain man made a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at the hour of supper to say to them that were invited that they should come, for now all things are ready. And they began all at once to make excuse. The first said to him, I have bought a farm and must needs go out and see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And the servant returning told these things to his Lord. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the feeble, and the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. But I say unto you that none of these men that were invited shall taste of my supper. And there we have a complementary gospel to what we heard today. Because our Lord has established this banquet, this nuptial banquet of the Lamb, as it is called in the book of Revelation. This nuptial banquet, this wedding banquet of the Lamb that we call the Mass. And the Mass is so many things. 
There's so many layers to what we are celebrating today. It is the unbloody representation of the sacrifice of Calvary. It is that. And it is also the nuptial banquet of the Lamb, where the Lord takes his bride to himself and offers her up to the Father in what originally, initially looks like a piece of bread. But our Lord takes his bride to himself and the two become one. Now that piece of bread becomes the body of Christ, but it becomes the living body of Christ, and so it has the blood of Christ in the body because he is living, he is resurrected. Now we have to consider then that we have First Holy Communion today, and that is why young ladies on, their, on the day of First Holy Communion wear a bridal gown and a bridal veil because it expresses that this is the wedding banquet of the Lamb and that betrothal begins at baptism, usually when a baby is eight days old, in imitation of our Lord who was circumcised on his eighth day. And so we baptize our babies close to the eighth day after they are born. This is because when they are born, they are a creature of God, but they're not a child of God. They're a creature of God. And they are a slave to the devil. Terrible as that sounds. But the devil considers that he has legal rights over a soul because of the sin of Adam. And that is what our Lord came to rescue us from. And so we baptize our babies even on the first day, if possible, after they're born. But traditionally on the eighth day or soon after. So that they are no longer a creature of God, but a child of God. For so baptism, they become a child of God. Now, last night I met two great young men. And one of them asked me, well, how can I be close to God? How can we possibly approach God? How can we be close to God? Well, God brings us close to him. We are like the prodigal son when we're baptized, we're washed clean, of all of our sins, we're anointed on the crown of our head, so we're crowned with that which makes us conformed to Christ, and we're made a son or a daughter of God, a child of God, no longer a creature. And so as a child, we're loved by our Father. You know, some Christians believe that we are despicable, that we're disgusting, that we're unlovable, and that God only tolerates us. That's a terrible, that's a terrible heresy that we would be disgusting and that God only tolerates us. That's a terrible heresy. The scriptures tell us not only that God will take away our stony hearts and give us a new heart, but also the Lord tells us that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit will dwell inside of us and therefore he would not dwell someplace that was disgusting. So he makes it beautiful. We're beautiful inside and out when we are in a state of grace. And that's what brings us close to God because we have God dwelling in our souls. So we're close to God. Our little ones who grow up in the church know from the, from the very youngest age that they're loved by God and that they belong here and they feel close to God. It's only when we become adults that all, all the mess of this world interrupts that. And we start asking questions, which God gave us a brain to ask questions, and we struggle with doubts or, or um, you know, struggle with faith. Well, that's okay. That happens. But sooner or later, the intellect cannot solve every problem. And our experiences are not everything either. We just have to trust that God knows what he's doing, that we belong to him. And then we need to, we need to strive to have a beautiful soul to be worthy of him so that we're not eating and drinking condemnation on ourselves, but we're eating and drinking eternal life, the medicine of immortality, which is what we call this Holy Communion, this Eucharist. And so our Lord gave us 
because we are so imperfect and we fall into sin. Our Lord gave us the sacrament of confession so our souls can be beautiful again when we've fallen into sin. And now think about the beauty of this church and the flowers on the altar and the beauty of everything that we do here. The music and the ceremonies are meant to be beautiful because we love God. And this is a wedding banquet. And if your daughter was getting married, you would have the most beautiful gown on her and you would have the most beautiful flowers at her wedding and you'd have wonderful food and hospitality and everybody would have a good time. And that's what the Mass needs to be like. That we wear beautiful clothing, all of us. Not out of compulsion, but out of love because we belong here because we're children of God who is so beautiful, we can't even describe or imagine how beautiful God is. And so we make things as beautiful as possible as a reminder of that. And that's why our little children get so dressed up for their first Holy Communion. We need to remember that. We should treat this Holy Communion today as if it were our first Holy Communion. And as if it could be our last. Because it might be for someone in this room, your last Holy Communion. And we should treat it as though it is your only Holy Communion you will ever receive. Now I realize we have many non-Catholics here. And there's a rule that goes back to the early church, even to the, to the first century, that you must be baptized you must be baptized in order to receive Holy Communion and you must be in a state of grace in order to receive Holy Communion. So Catholics just don't automatically receive Holy Communion. We have to be prepared, we have to go to confession, all of that. But you also have to be in communion with the church. You have to be in communion with the church. That goes back to the very beginnings of Christianity. That you have to be in communion with the Catholic Church and believe everything that the Catholic Church believes. And so there is something of, uh, an ex there is something of an exclusiveness to that. But that acknowledges and respects your freedom. Your freedom to choose which way you wish to go. Are you with God or are you against God? Are you with this church, the one true church. And yes, we dare to claim that. This is the only church that was founded by Christ himself. And so it is the one true church. As troublesome as it is, as many problems and scandals as there are within the church, and there are plenty, and there will be till the end of time. But that is because it is the one true church. But nevertheless, as many problems as we have, we trust that God will be with us and that the gates of Hades will fight against us, but they will not prevail until he comes again. So we welcome all of our visitors, but we can't welcome you to communion until you become Catholic. And we would also ask the Catholics who are not sufficiently prepared or who are not in a state of grace or who are not living their lives in a way consistent with what we believe, that you would refrain. And we don't say this to be mean, we say this because we love you. I don't want anyone to eat and drink condemnation or judgment upon himself. I don't want anyone to be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. And so that is out of love that I would say refrain. And go make a good confession and then come back with a beautiful soul and give that beautiful soul as a gift to your loving God who loves you. You are not disgusting to him. You are not totally depraved. You are lovable and God wants you to be his child. God wants you to have a beautiful soul and God wants you to be in heaven with him forever. And that's what we're here for. Well, I wish all of our children a very blessed day. It's the beginning of an even closer relationship you will have with God now 
that you will be receiving communion for the first time. And let us all receive as though this were our first time as well. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.